this lecture, and it doesn't quite match what I think I'm actually going to talk about. So uh, what I would like to do in this lecture is take phase conjecture and tell you what it means in the function field case and relate it to this, uh, the structure of the modulized factor of G functions. So let me begin um, reviewing a couple of uh, definitions. So recall. which appears as a finite extension of something where you take a field with p elements, add some element x, and then take a finite extension thereof. So in this lecture, we're going to focus our attention on a function field k. And by definition, every function field contains a finite field. If it's a finite extension of fp brackets x, then it contains fp. But typically, it contains a bigger finite field. And in fact, there's a largest finite field that it contains. So I'm going to write fq for a finite field with two elements. Inside a function field, there's some you know, maximal fq. And as I mentioned in the first lecture, function fields are related to algebraic geometry. So in this situation, you can associate an algebraic curve, which I'll denote by x, that's defined over the field f2. And when I say an algebraic curve, I'm always going to mean a smooth projective curve, which is related to k in the following way, that uh, k is the field of rational function. of x. And this actually gives you a dictionary that says the data of a function field is the same as the data of an algebraic curve defined over a finite field. So these, the algebraic curve x and the function field k are really interchangeable with one another. So the first thing that I want to do is uh, introduce some notation for talking about function fields. And I want to also emphasize the analogy with number fields um, by explaining what the analogs of each uh, object that I'm going to introduce is in terms of Monday's lecture. So um, let's say on one side we'll have objects from Monday's lecture side will have objects from today's lecture. So in today's lecture, I'm going to be talking about a function field k. And the analog of that in Monday's lecture would be the field q of rational numbers. Now, function field I can think of as an algebraic curve. And if I have an algebraic curve, I can talk about its points. So I'm going to write little x to denote closed point of this algebraic curve capital X. So for the rest of this lecture, whenever I say point, I always mean closed point. And the analog of this over here is choice of a prime number. P and C, and maybe depending on how strong you want the analogy to be, you also want to include something that you call infinity corresponding to the Archimedean place. Now every point of the curve x has a, a residue field, which I'll denote by kappa of x. So this is the residue field of x at the point little x. This will be a finite field, in fact, a, a finite extension of the field f2. And that has an analog over here, which is to each prime number, you can associate the field z mod p. Now another object that we can associate to a point is what I'll write as O sub x. This is the completed local ring. So 
this is a ring which is isomorphic to a power series ring in one variable over the residue field kappa of x. This isomorphism is not canonical. It depends on choosing a local coordinate on your algebraic curve at the point of x. And the analog of that in Conte's lecture was to each prime number p, you can associate the p-adic integers. There's also what I'm going to write as k sub x. This is just going to denote the fraction field. this ring O sub x. And the analog of that in Monday's lecture was to each prime number p, you have the field qp of p-adic rational numbers. And maybe also you want to include what you do with the Archimedean place, which is the Archimedean completion of the rational numbers. And finally, in Monday's lecture, we had this ring of Adele's, which is roughly what you got by multiplying together all of these completions of uh, the rational numbers at various places. Similarly here, there's an object called the Adels of x, which is defined to be a subset of the product over all the closed points of the local field k sub x at that point. It's not the entire product. It's what's called the restricted product, meaning that you only allow denominators at finitely many places. So uh, now I want to talk about Bayes' conjecture. So what we're going to do is fix, uh, simply connect it. algebraic groups in general, an example would be, you can take, uh, sorry, this group is going to be called G. An example would be you can take G to be SLN. And this example is already, everything that I'm going to say is, is pretty interesting for SLN. And now in this situation, here, well, let's say, so this choice of G is analogous in Monday's lecture to a, a choice of rational quadratic form. Let's say a choice of quadratic form with coefficients in the rational numbers. And now to this algebraic group G, you can talk about its points which take values in any algebra over k. So in particular, you can talk about its points with values in the Adels. And that's analogous over here to considering something like um, SOQ of the Adels, or better yet, spin Q of the Adels would be a better analogy. And just as in Monday's lecture, this <coughs> field of Adels, or sorry, this ring of Adels, actually has a topology coming from multiplying together the topologies of all of these local fields. And that makes it into a locally compact ring, and therefore this group into a locally compact group. And just as in Monday's lecture, it comes with a canonical measure. So there's a Tamagawa measure on these groups, and this group has something called Tamagawa measure. Let me remind you of what Bayes' conjecture says. Um, in the function field case, it would say that if you take the Tamagawa measure, well, of this locally compact group, modulo the action of g of k, which sits inside as a discrete subgroup, you want to claim that this is equal to 1. So the first thing that I want to do is to take this statement and just go backwards through Monday's lecture. Um, we arrived at this statement in Monday's lecture as a, a translation of a much more concrete statement that had to do with counting things like quadratic forms. 
I would like to transform this statement similarly into something concrete. And in order to do that, we need to fix another choice. So I told you here that G was a semi-simple algebraic group defined over the field K. But um, now what I want to do is to fix an integral model of G. G, uh, I'm going to denote this also by G, although it's a, a different object, as what's called an affine group scheme. So G is actually going to be some algebraic variety with a map to X where you have a group structure on each fiber. So for each X in the curve X, you can look at the fiber, G sub X, and this is an this will be an algebraic group over the fraction field, I'm sorry, over the residue field kappa of X. So this choice is analogous what we were actually working with in Monday's lecture, which is that we had a quadratic form, not with rational coefficients, but with integer coefficients. So if you have any quadratic form on a rational vector space, you can always choose a lattice inside that rational vector space on which your quadratic form is integral. Um, and that lattice is not unique. There are several choices for it. And this is analogous to a choice of lattice or a making a coordinate change so that your quadratic form has integer coefficients. So let me um, just warn you, a warning, um, the condition, we're assuming that the algebraic group that you have over the field K is semi-simple. And what that tells you about these fibers is that they're semi-simple almost always. But you can't assume that all of them are semi-simple. So at finitely many points, g sub x might fail to be semi-simple. That is, it might in some sense have bad reduction. Um, but, so that's the bad news. But the good news is that uh, Nevertheless, we can arrange that this map has lots of good properties. Namely, we can assume that each g sub x is smooth and connected. And this uh, warning also has an analog in Monday's lecture. If you have a rational quadratic form, you can always change coordinates so that it looks like an integral quadratic form. But you can't arrange that that integral quadratic form has, behaves well when you reduce it mod p for every p. You can't always arrange that it's unimodular. In general, there will be finitely many primes p such that it becomes degenerate when reduced mod p. And that's, uh, those are analogous to these points here. So now what did we do on Monday, in Monday's lecture? But well, once you fix this group, let me note that here. So this, inter this integral model uh, determines where you a subgroup of G of the Adels. Namely, you can take the product over all points of X of G of local ring at the point x. And this subgroup is actually a compact open subgroup. And now remember, in Monday's lecture, it was interesting to look at the collection of left cosets, g of the Adels mod g of k, as being acted on on the right by this compact open subgroup, or by what was Monday's analog of this compact open subgroup. And if you want to say something about the measure of this quotient, well, your naive guess for what it is, is the measure of the group that's acting times the number of orbits. 
And that naive guess is a little bit off, but it's pretty close. Or it's, it's, you can correct for it by uh, counting orbits with the appropriate multiplicities. So let me just ask now the following question. What are the orbits? The analogous question on Monday were that orbits of, for this action parametrized equivalence classes of quadratic forms within a genus. And it, the analog of that in this setting is that orbits correspond to uh, what are called principal G bundles on the curve X. Um, more precisely, the collection of orbits is the collection of isomorphism classes of principal G bundles on X. So recall, G is a group in the category of algebraic varieties with a map to X. A principal G bundle means another algebraic variety mapping to X, which has an action of G. Uh, and this action should be simply transitive. So in particular, for every point of x, if you take the fiber of p that's acted on by the fiber of g, and this should, uh, the action of g sub x on p sub x should be simply transitive. So an example of a g bundle on x is g itself. That's called the trivial g bundle on x. And we say that a, in general, a g bundle is trivial if it's isomorphic to g. Um, now it's not true in this, that every G bundle is trivial. But you can, you can uh, always trivialize G bundles once you make carve X up into some pieces. But let me tell you a few theorems about trivializing G bundles. So first, the theorem of Harder is um, any G bundle on x is generically trivial. So what I mean is, one way to say it is that it becomes trivial when you restrict it to the generic point, that is the spectrum of the function field k. Or another way to say it is that it's, it's trivial on an open set. U can take it x, meaning trivial away from a finite collection of points. And here I'm playing in this situation, will tell you that any G bundle P on X is trivial meaning at each closed point of the curve. And hence, using the smoothness of G, um, trivial in what you might call the formal neighborhood. are the same thing. So here's a picture of the algebraic curve x. And now we have some g-bundle. And that g-bundle is trivialized outside of a couple of points. Maybe there's three points in this picture where you can't uh, trivialize the g-bundle thanks to Harder's theorem. And Lang's theorem tells you, well, 
you can still trivialize the G bundle also in a small, what you might call a formal disk, around each one of these points. And now if you want to recover a G bundle, you want to understand the structure of a G bundle, one way to do it is to choose a trivialization generically to choose a trivialization around each point and then study how those trivializations differ um, on the puncture disks that you get by uh, looking at each one of these disks and deleting the point where your first trivialization is not defined. So if P is the G bundle, you can choose a generic trivialization. trivialization on each uh, one of these formal disks. And let's just do it on a trivialization, two such a trivialization for every point of x. Um, Ox is the completion of the local ring? Ox is the completion of the local ring, yeah. If you choose a trivialization on each of these guys, um, they differ. an element of the group, which is G evaluated on Kx. Kx is the ring of functions on these punctured disks. And so as x varies, you get an element of um, G of the Adels, which sits inside the product over all x of G of Kx. So these elements of G of Kx um, they will actually be integral, meaning they'll belong to G of OX at every point except for these three in this picture here. But the element of G of AX that you get, just as in Monday's lecture, depends on some choices. It depends on the generic trivialization that you chose, which is ambiguous up to action of the group G of K, and it's ambiguous up to the choices of trivialization that you made at each point which is this compact open subgroup, a uh, product over x of g of x. So what you actually get here uh, out of your g bundle is a well-defined double coset. And you can show that this construction it gives you a bijection between isomorphism classes of g bundles and double cosets. The essential content of that is in these two theorems. So using this description, you can uh, restate the content of Bayes' conjecture as a, about counting G bundles up to isomorphism. So let me just jump ahead to that. So Bayes' conjecture, let's say, in, as a mass formula, is saying something about the number of isomorphism classes of G bundles. But just as in Monday's lecture, you have to count those with multiplicity. So if you take a sum over all isomorphism classes of G bundles P, one over the size of the automorphism group of P, this will always be some finite group, then, well, what this will be a priori is the Tamagawa measure of uh, G of the Adels mod P of K divided by the Tamagawa measure of the group that's acting, which is the product over X of G of OX. But this denominator is something that you can explicitly evaluate. And this numerator is something that's supposed to be equal to 1. So, uh, well, this is not a conjecture. This is, um, the conjecture is that this, you have a formula for what this is. And the formula looks like this. It's a certain power of Q, which I'll tell you about in a little bit, times a product over all the closed points of your curve of the size of the residue field at that point raised to the dth power. So here d is going to denote the dimension of our algebraic group g. 
<coughs> divided by um, the size of the group G of kappa x. So note, kappa x is a finite field. And so G of kappa x is going to be a finite group. And a naive guess for how big that finite group would be would be the size of the field raised to the dimension of G. So these fractions are numbers that you might expect to be pretty close to 1, which is why you might expect this product to be a, a reasonable thing to consider. And if you just go through the logic of what I sketched on Monday, this is what Bayes' conjecture translates to. So let me just remark one uh, point at which the analogy with Monday's lecture breaks is that in Monday's lecture, the mass of a quadratic form was given by a finite sum. You can actually prove that uh, if you fix a positive definite quadratic form, there's only finitely many equivalence classes in its genus. But in this situation, that essentially never happens. This sum on the left-hand side is over an infinite collection of isomorphism classes of g-bundles. Even though there are infinitely many g-bundles, um, as you start listing them, you find that they have more and more symmetries. And the sum on the left-hand side nevertheless makes sense. It's a convergent sum. So the content of this statement is the left-hand side is an infinite sum, the right-hand side is an infinite product. Both of those expressions converge, and they converge to the same thing. So, so far so good. But now I want to make use of something. Let me remind you, we're now working over a function field rather than over a number field. So everything's supposed to be easy. This is supposed to be easy to prove, or we're supposed to have uh, extra tools for attacking this problem that we didn't have in Monday's lecture. And those extra tools are a connection with algebraic geometry. So in Monday's lecture, the thing we wanted to count was quadratic forms within a genus. And you could organize that collection into a set, but the set didn't have a lot of structure to it. In this lecture, what we're trying to classify are principal G bundles on a curve, and those have more structure. They're, they have a sort of algebraic parameterization that comes from the fact that it makes sense not just to talk about uh, individual G bundles on a curve, but families of G bundles on curves. So let me articulate that a little bit more precisely. Um, so I want to introduce an object, which I'll denote by bun GX. So this is called the moduli stack of G bundles. And this object is characterized by the following property. That if I give you a map from some algebraic variety, Y, into bun GX, um, these are supposed to be identified with G bundles <coughs> on X cross Y. So when y is a point, and here by point I mean the spectrum of fq, um, then I'm talking about g bundles on x itself. So this is some sort of supposed to be some sort of object whose points are g bundles. Now uh, this object is an example of what's called an algebraic stack. So if you're not familiar with the notion of an algebraic stack, you can pretend for the rest of this lecture that this thing is like an algebraic variety and it won't be too misleading. Um, but one sense in which uh, that's sort of clearly not appropriate is that the right-hand side of this equality, G bundles on X cross Y, that's something that you should really not think of as forming a set. You should think of it as forming a category or a groupoid. Because G bundles on X cross Y can have automorphisms. And you don't want to ignore those automorphisms. And so, the word stack here essentially means we're keeping track of those automorphisms. And this is a, the sort of object for which maps from Y into bun G form a category rather than a set. OK, so what's Bayes' conjecture um, is saying? So this sum that appears on the left-hand side of 1 over 
homomorphism of p. If you ignore this denominator, that's just counting the number of isomorphism classes of G bundles on X. So heuristically, you can think about this as the number of points of bunch. More precisely, it's the number of points counted with multiplicity where you take into account that the points form a category. So now I want to go on a little digression about another very famous idea of André Vey. It was about the problem of counting the number of points that you have on varieties over a finite field. So let Z be a, let's say, a projective algebraic variety. So Z, something that sits inside some projective space as a collection of solutions to some polynomial equations where the coefficients of those polynomials have to belong to FQ. And in this situation, you can ask, I'm going to write Z of FQ for the set of FQ value points of Z, meaning the collection of all solutions to those equations where the found in the field FQ itself. So this is some finite set. And uh, they had the idea of trying to understand this finite set by thinking of it inside something larger, which is the set of all uh, solutions to these equations over the algebraically closed field FQ bar. And that you can think of, let me actually give this object a name. Or this is a set, but this is the set of points of an algebraic variety that I'll write as z bar, which is defined over this algebraically closed field. So this is um, now an algebraic variety, but you can extract this finite set from this algebraic variety via a particularly explicit procedure. Namely, there's a map from z bar to itself called the Fermanius map. Um, if you think of z bar as sitting inside projective space, this comes from a map from projective space to itself, which just carries uh, something with homogeneous coordinates a0, a1, through an something with homogeneous coordinates a0 to the q, a1 to the q, dot, 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 a n to the q. So the fact that uh, your algebraic variety was defined by polynomials where the coefficients are in fq guarantees that this construction of raising everything to the qth power takes solutions to solutions. And therefore, you get a map of algebraic varieties. And the observation is that this finite set z of fq can be identified with a set of fixed points for this Fermanius map from z bar to z. So today's idea was you can try to count the size of this finite set by applying some version of the left shed's fixed point formula. So idea, the size of z of f2 should be given by some kind of alternating sum, um, <coughs> i greater than or equal to 0 minus times the i times the trace of this Frobenius map acting on the i-th cohomology group of z bar. So this is sort of a heuristic idea when it was originally introduced. Because if you have an algebraic variety over the complex numbers, say, then it has an underlying topological space with the analytic topology. And it's sensible to do things like look at its homology and cohomology. But, uh, if you have an algebraic variety defined over a field which doesn't have any topology of its own, 
like a finite field or the algebraic closure of a finite field, then it's not really sensible to try to um, assign something like the singular cohomology of its underlying topological space. That won't give you a reasonable uh, notion of cohomology. But nonetheless, guided by this heuristic, they made a number of predictions about the numerical behavior of numbers of points of varieties defined over finite fields. And these conjectures uh, that he made were eventually proven by Grothendieck and his students, who introduced the theory of L-adic cohomology, which made sense of these kind of cohomology groups in such a way that uh, this statement became clear. So this idea of A is now what's called the growth and deep left shots trace point. So the number of points of Z F Q is given by the trace of alternating sum with the trace of Frobenius on these groups where here you use what are called the L-adic cohomology groups. All right, so let me uh, talk about a couple of variants of this uh, mm -hmm. the trace formula. So the first thing I want to do is drop the assumption that Z is projective. So if Z is a general algebraic variety, let's say quasi-projective, so it's an open subset of a projective algebraic variety, then there's a generalization of this statement. The only thing you have to change is that instead of cohomology, you use compactly supported cohomology. So more generally, or any Y, or I'm sorry, any algebraic variety Z, uh, number of points is given by an, an expression like this, which is an alternating sum of traces, is going to come up again and again in this lecture and the next lecture. So I'm going to, I'll write it one more time. So an alternating sum over i greater than or equal to zero minus one to the i times the trace of Frobenius on compactly supported cohomology of z bar. But from now on, I'm just going to denote this by the trace of Frobenius on the compactly supported cohomologies. Now, suppose that you are interested in a non-compact variety, but you don't want to work with compactly supported cohomology. Suppose you want to phrase this instead in terms of ordinary cohomology. So if Z is smooth, then in this theory of L-adic uh, cohomology, you have a version of Poincaré duality, which tells you that compactly supported cohomology and non-compactly supported cohomology are dual to each other. And what this tells you is that you get a formula for the number of points of Z of FQ, which has a similar expression, but instead of the Frobenius, you have to use the inverse of the Frobenius homology of z bar, and it's off by a factor. So if z is smooth of dimension d, then what you're actually counting is the number of points of z of fq divided by q to the d. So this factor of q to the d comes from the fact that when you write down Poincaré duality in L-adic cohomology, it's not quite invariant under the Frobenius. It's off, sort of fails to be equivariant uh, with respect to this factor. So note, um, this number on the left is a number that you might expect to be kind of close to 1. Right? If I gave you an algebraic variety over a finite field and I told you to guess how many points it has, um, your first question might be, all right, well, what's the dimension? If it's d-dimensional and the field has q elements, Maybe your naive estimate is q to the d for the number of points. And this is telling you, uh, well, that's the leading term in this trace. This is the one that you get from the term when i is equal to 0. OK, 
So I want to apply these ideas not to an algebraic variety, instead to an algebraic stack, more specifically the moduli stack of G-bubbles. So let's apply this for Z equal to one G X. So this is not an algebraic variety, it's an algebraic stack, but it's a smooth algebraic stack. And in particular, it has a well-defined dimension. So you can talk about what you want to call the number of points of bungee X, which I said earlier is the sum want to count things with multiplicity. And then if you divide this by the dimension of function x, then you can ask if there's some trace formula which will compute this for you as the trace of some inverse Frobenius on the cohology of put a bar over it to indicate that you're supposed to first extend scalars to uh, the algebraic closure of FQ. So this statement is true. Um, so in many cases, for example, when G is SLN or any split group, uh, this is proven in the thesis of Kai Behrens and his idea can be, uh, or sorry, primarily, and his uh, strategy can be generalized to uh, any of the kind of groups that we're considering here. So let me remove the question mark and say, so there's some both of the left trace formula which applies in this situation. And let me just say a quick word about the proof. Um, so it doesn't follow formally from the both of the left trace formula in its usual incarnation. Uh, but the problem isn't really that bun g x is a stack. Uh, the problem is that bun g x is not quasi-compact. Right? So another way of saying it is the problem is that the sum on the left-hand side is actually an infinite sum. So even uh, whatever you're going to do to prove this is going to somehow have to grapple with convergence issues. Um, you know, the, let me remark, in this situation, this is an infinite sum over isomorphism classes of G bundles. And now the cohomology of bun GX lives in infinitely many degrees. So both sides of this equation are infinite sums, and you have to wrestle with convergence issues. But the strategy is, uh, that Kai Baron used is to choose a convenient stratification of this moduli stack of G bundles, specifically the harder nar simhan stratification. And each stratum of the harder Narasimhan stratification can be realized as a smooth algebraic variety modulo the action of a, an algebraic group. And by applying the broken deep left shed's trace formula to each of those varieties and each of those groups individually, you will extract a formula like this, except, <coughs> you know, you, except that you need to rearrange some infinite sums in order to do it. So then you need to... Uh, Check carefully that the infinite sums that you're rearranging are, uh, that you're not cheating. And this can be generalized to, uh, to non ethic groups as well. So this left-hand side is something pretty close to what we were interested in in the situation of Bayes' conjecture. Let me just remark that what Bayes' conjecture will predict is that this left-hand side is equal to um, the thing which was the Euler product, the product over the closed points of x of um, size of kappa x to the d divided by the order of g of kappa x. Uh, so that factor of q that I didn't tell you about earlier on the right-hand side has now been moved to the left-hand side. That fact the exponent was actually, uh, in conceptual terms, the dimension of this moduli stack on GX. <laughs> so let's say you give yourself 
the growth and deep left shed's trace formula for one GX, then what you want to do, forget the interpretation in terms of counting G bundles, what you want to do is compute something about that trace. So Bayes' conjecture can now be converted into the statement that the trace of this inverse gradients on the cohomology of on GX. Um, has this particular Euler product expression. So let me actually uh, give you a different way of thinking about what's appearing on the right-hand side here. So in addition to thinking about G bundles on the entire curve X, you can also think about G bundles that are defined just at a single point. And this is the Montelai stack. Uh, this, this, there's another notation for this Montelai stack. This is the classifying stack for the fiber of G at the point X. And you can contemplate things like the number of points of this stack counted with multiplicity, which would be a sum like that, except instead of requiring our G bundle to be defined everywhere, it just has to be defined at this point little x. But Lang's theorem that I mentioned earlier tells you that that sum would actually have just one term. Every G bundle that's defined just at the point x is trivial. And the automorphism group the trivial G bundle is just this finite group G of kappa x, which is appearing in this description. So also this BGX is a, it's an example of an algebraic stack. You can think of it as a point mod the action of GX. And in the setting of stacks, this is smooth and has a dimension, um, namely the dimension is minus the dimension of the group G. Because you, you took something which was of dimension 0 and divided out by the action of something having dimension D. So another way to think about this fraction for, for each particular x is that what you're doing is taking the number of points of uh, the modulized stack of G bundles at the point X and dividing by the field that this stack is defined over, the size of that field, raised to the power of the dimension. Fun G. It's exactly the analog of this expression here, except uh, instead of uh, Instead of using the entire curve, you're using just one point. So here, the numerator here is 1 over this denominator, and the denominator is 1 over this numerator. Now, this moduli stack of G bundles at a single point also satisfies the growth in deep left shed's trace formula. That's something much easier than proving it over the entire curve. And so this expression has another name, <coughs> has another uh, description. It says the product over all the points of x of the trace of the Frobenius inverse on the cohomology now of the moduli stack of G bundles just at one point. Bayes changed the algebraic closure, and this is the Frobenius uh, for the field kappa x. So Bayes' conjecture is an equality between two expressions, each of which can be expressed as a trace of some Frobenius map on some big uh, uh, homology group. So I want to give a heuristic explanation for why you might expect a statement like this to be true. So when I first learned what a vector bundle was, I was given the following heuristic description 
to give a vector bundle on a space x, you have to give a vector space at every point, and they have to vary continuously as the point moves. And you could say the same thing about principal g-bundles. A g-bundle on a space x is giving one is equivalent to giving a g-bundle at every point and somehow having them vary continuously. So let me write that as a heuristic equation. Bun g of x is equal to, and I'll put in quotation marks here, uh, a product over all the points of x of bun g at a point. Uh, but this product should be interpreted as some kind of a continuous product. So this is a heuristic, or I mean, of course, you can make it precise, but then it becomes a tautology. Um, but another situation in which it would essentially be a tautology is if x was not an algebraic curve, but it was somehow a finite set, made of finitely many points. And then g bundles on a finite set is just a product over the points of that set of moduli stack of g bundles on each point individually. And if you had a product decomposition like that, you would expect to be able to say something about cohomology uh, by Kunin's formula. So let's, everything is in quotation marks. So let's imagine that we had some kind of continuous Kunin formula. The continuous Kunin formula would say something like the cohomology of bun gx. I should base change everything to the algebraic closure. Um, should be expressed as some kind of continuous tensor product of the cohomologies of all of these uh, individual factors. And now, if you imagine you had something like this, and that you have some uh, automorphism of this vector space given by the Frobenius, which itself decomposed as a tensor product of automorphisms of these individual factors. So then you might expect um, that the trace of that automorphism on the left-hand side is just the product of the traces on the factors that appear on the right-hand side, which is ex exactly the precise statement which is appearing um, appearing in Bayes' conjecture. That's exactly the kind of thing that would justify uh, the equality that you're looking for. So um, how much time have I got left? Five minutes. So let me just advertise. So in lecture four, so this is sort of where uh, Dennis and I enter the story. So in lecture four, I want to tell you something about making this idea precise. So. In lecture four, we will sketch how to remove the quotation marks um, from this second expression. And more specifically, there's this statement along the lines that the cohomology of bun gx can be computed as what's called the factorization homology of uh, the factorization algebra which is made out of these uh, cohomologies of bun g at the individual points. So I just want to uh, remark briefly about how this connects with uh, what we did in the previous lecture. So the idea is you want to prove this statement, which is an equality of numbers, by first proving some statement about having an isomorphism of vector spaces and then extracting the numbers by taking the traces of some endomorphisms. Now, those uh, endomorphisms, they come from the Frobenius, which is something that has to do with finite fields. But a story like this actually doesn't have much to do with finite fields. It's a story that you can make sense of over any field. And in particular, it's a story that you can make sense of over the complex numbers. So let's pretend for a moment that we were over the complex numbers. So let's suppose that x is a curve 
number of complex number C, and I'm going to identify it with its C value points, so with the, the associated compact Riemann surface. So in particular, I'm going to think of X as a two manifold. And let me assume also that the group G that I've been talking about, um, so let's say G is constant. Meaning it's not a family of groups parameterized by X, but it's just going to be a constant family associated to your favorite uh, semi-simple, simply connected semi-simple complex Lie group. And your favorite group could be like G is SLM. And then this object, bungie x. So this makes sense as an algebraic stack over the complex numbers. But it has a top, purely topological incarnation. Um, we can talk about the homotopy type of this. And the homotopy type of this is the same as the homotopy type of the space of maps from x into the classifying space of g. And here, when I write the classifying space of g, I mean in the sense of topology. So G I think of as a as a complex Lie group, and I take its class. I take root G. So we're exactly in, then in the situation of the previous lecture. We have a manifold, in this case of dimension two, and we're trying to study the space of maps from that manifold into some target. And that target is pretty highly connected. It's actually three connected. And to apply the theorem of the previous lecture that I called non-abelian Poincaré duality, you would just need to know that it was simply connected. So, uh, so the previous lecture gives a description of this space of maps from x into bg as, well, there's some homotopy pole limit over uh, u contained in x. So this is, we're now not in algebraic geometry anymore. We're in topology. So when I write u contained in x, I mean u is allowed to be things like a disjoint union of finitely many disks. And you take a direct limit of compactly supported maps from open stuff like that. And so what I want to explain in the, in the next lecture is that a description like this sort of can be reformulated as giving you an, a statement like this. And uh, of course, if you want this statement for x defined not over the complex numbers, but over other fields, like finite fields, then you need some analog of this homotopy co-limit description that makes sense in algebraic geometry. So I'm out of time, but that's what we'll talk about next time. Thank you. Questions? What sort of groups um, can you get at the points of bad reduction of our micro model? Well, um, you have some freedom because there's lots of models. And actually, in the proof, it's convenient to, uh, when you're forced to have a bad model, to make it as bad as possible. So you can, one way to make it really bad is to take a proof that maybe was good at a point or kind of good at a point and do a blow up of that uh, group scheme at, at the origin. Um, and that will have the effect after you do the blow up of replacing that fiber by uh, by a vector, you know, something that looks like a product of copies of the atom. So that's sort of the worst that it can look. Um, can, is there a way to interpret it? So uh, can I interpret that as in terms of like G bundles with some additional structure for the forces for that? Yeah. So um, uh, if you have a G and then you make a G prime by this blow up procedure then it has the feature that G prime bundles are the same as G bundles with the trivialization at that point. Yeah? Uh, does any of this apply when X is a bigger dimension than one? Yeah, so let me remark about... 
So let me talk about this identification for a second. Right, so this, this thing on the left-hand side really classifies topological key bundles on X. And this thing on the right-hand side classifies sort of like holomorphic key bundles on X over the complex numbers. And there, you don't see a difference between those homotopy types because if you have a, let's not say topological, let's say you have a smooth G bundle, then to make it a holomorphic G bundle, you just have to choose a D bar connection on it. Now, if you were in higher dimensions, there's an analogous statement, but what you would have to do is choose a flat D bar connection on it. And the condition of being flat is some nonlinear differential equation that you have to solve. And in particular, you, you would not expect these spaces to be homotopy equivalent if you had to contemplate solving that equation. I mean, there is this theory of an adelic approach to vector bundles and surfaces. Okay. Or you could, I mean, the earlier part of your talk. But this is not like really, that's not, or the, the non-abelian Poincaré duality uh, oh, yeah, statement I mean. is not really like the, uh, the double coset description of this. Oh. It's, um, It's important, well, where did I go? In this description, um, you can think of this as saying you have a map for the moduli space of G bundles consisting of G bundles that are trivialized away from a finite set of points. But that finite set of points is not, you can't require it to be fixed. You have to allow the points to sort of move around and collide with each other. Yeah? Is there a convenient sort of statement of this mean zero in terms of the structure of L functions for the class functions? Well, the main theorem aiming a statement like this. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like the third well, says I mean, this is something that sort of has a consequence for L functions, which is, I mean, this is something that makes sense over any field. Um, and if you start with something that's defined over a field K, and this bar means you base change to the algebraic closure of K, you get an isomorphism of vector spaces with, which have an action of the Galois group of K bar over K. So if you're doing something over a, a number field or a function field or something like that, then you, uh, then you can take those Galois representations and you know, try to extract some L functions. And this would give you, um, you know, some information about them. Yeah. Do, do these techniques give you information about other structures like Higgs bundles or local systems? I don't want to say no, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm not aware of inf such information, but I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if you could get some. Everything you've shown so far seems like it might go through the other shows the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> the, the text formula uh, for, uh, for the stack of cheap bundles. So now, after you've done the uh, argument for non constant group schemes, do you have any sense of you can actually do this argument with the reformation? And canceling the parasitic terms in the sum uh, for more general stacks which are locally finite type. Can you just abstractly say I have a stack which is locally finite type and say it has something like a curve nest stratification and then it will always have a trace formula? I don't believe that. I think you, you don't believe that. I mean what's important about the stratification, the harder and our simple stratification has infinitely many strata. But what's important about it is that this, the strata fall into finitely many families, which essentially look exactly like each other up to some um, like bundles of affine spaces. So I mean, that's what you exploit in order to get these sums to converge. You exploit that you can break them into finitely many sums that look like some factor that you don't understand times a geometric series. OK, any more questions? Let's try to take up again.